as the nationwide uprising against police brutality and racism continues to roil the nation and the world, bringing down Confederate statues and forcing a reckoning in city halls and on the streets. President Trump defended law enforcement Thursday, dismissing growing calls to defund the police. He spoke at a campaign-style event at a church in Dallas, Texas, announcing a new executive order advising police departments to adopt national standards for use of force. Trump did not invite the top three law enforcement officials in Dallas, who are all African American. The move comes after Trump called protesters thugs and threatened to deploy the U.S. military to end, quote, riots and lawlessness. This is Trump speaking Thursday. They want to get rid of the police forces. They actually want to get rid of it. And that's what they do, and that's where they'd go. And you know that, because at the top position, there's not going to be much leadership. There's not much leadership left. Instead, we have to go the opposite way. We must invest more energy and resources in police training and recruiting and community engagement. We have to respect our police. We have to take care of our police. They're protecting us. And if they're allowed to do their job, they'll do a great job. And you always have a bad apple no matter where you go. You have bad apples. And uh, there are not too many of them. And I can tell you, there are not too many of them in the police department. We all know a lot of members of the police. Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden is also calling for an increase to police funding. In an op-ed in USA Today, he called for police departments to receive an additional $300 million to, quote, reinvigorate community policing in our country. On Wednesday night, Biden discussed police funding on The Daily Show. I don't believe police should be defunded, but I think the conditions should be placed upon them where departments are having to take significant reforms. Relating to that, we should set up a national use of force standard. But many argue reform will not fix the inherently racist system of policing. Since the global protest movement began, Minneapolis has pledged to dismantle its police department. The mayors of Los Angeles and New York City have promised to slash police department budgets, and calls to defund the police are being heard in spaces that would have been unthinkable just a few weeks ago. Well, for more on this historic moment, we are spending the hour with the legendary activist and scholar Angela Davis, professor emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. For half a century, Angela Davis has been one of the most influential activists and intellectuals in the United States, an icon of the black liberation movement. Angela Davis's work around issues of gender, race, class and prisons has influenced critical thought and social movements across several generations. She's a leading advocate for prison abolition, a position informed by her own experience as a prisoner and a fugitive on the FBI's top 10 wanted list more than 40 years ago. Once caught, she faced the death penalty in California. After being acquitted on all charges, she spent her life fighting to change the criminal justice system. Angela Davis, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us today for the hour. Thank you very much, Amy. It's wonderful to be here. Well, do you think this moment is a tipping point, a turning point? You, who have been involved in activism for almost half a century, do you see this moment as different, perhaps more different than any period of time you have lived through? Absolutely. This is uh, an extraordinary moment. I've never experienced uh, anything like the conditions we are currently experiencing. Um, the conjuncture created by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the recognition of the systemic racism that had that has been rendered visible under uh, uh, these uh, conditions because of the disproportionate deaths in Black and Latinx communities. And this is a moment I don't know whether I ever expected to experience. Um, when the protests began, uh, of course, around the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud uh, Aubrey and Tony McDade and many others who've lost their lives to racist state violence um, and vigilante violence. Um, when these protests erupted, I remembered something that I've uh, said uh, many uh, times to encourage activists who often feel that 
the work that they do is not leading to tangible results. Um, I often ask them to consider the very long trajectory of black struggles. And, and what has been most important is the forging of legacies and new arenas of struggle that can be handed down to younger generations. But I've often said, one never knows when conditions may give rise to a conjuncture such as the current one um, that rapidly shifts popular consciousness and suddenly allows us to move in the direction of radical change. If one does not engage in the ongoing work, when such a moment arises, we cannot take advantage of the opportunities uh, to uh, change. Um, and of course, this moment will pass. The intensity of the current demonstrations cannot be sustained over time, uh, but we will have to be ready to shift gears and address these issues in different arenas, including, of course, the electoral arena. Angela Davis, you've more long been a leader of the critical resistance movement, um, the abolition movement. And I'm wondering if you can explain the demand as you see it, what you feel needs to be done around defunding the police and then around prison abolition. Well, the call to defund the police is, I think, an abolitionist uh, demand. But it reflects only one aspect of uh, the process represented by uh, the demand. Defunding the police is not simply about withdrawing funding for law enforcement and doing nothing else. And it appears as if uh, this is uh, the, 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 the rather superficial understanding uh, that has caused um, Biden to move in the direction he's moving in. It's about shifting public funds to new services and, and, and new institutions, uh, mental health counselors uh, who um, can respond to people who are in crisis without arms. Uh, it's about shifting funding to education, to housing, to recreation. Uh, all of these things help to create security and safety. Um, it's about learning that safety, safeguarded by violence, is not really safety. And I would say that abolition is not primarily a negative strategy. It's not primarily about dismantling, getting rid of, but it's about re-envisioning. It's about building anew. And I would argue that abolition is a feminist uh, strategy, uh, and one sees in these abolitionist demands that are, are emerging the pivotal influence of, of feminist uh, theories and practices. Explain that further. Um, well, I want us to see feminism not only as addressing um, issues of gender, uh, but rather as a methodological approach uh, of, of understanding the intersectionality of, 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 of struggles uh, and, 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 and issues. Uh, um, abolition feminism counters carceral feminism, which has unfortunately assume that issues such as violence against women can be effectively addressed by um, using police force, by, uh, by, 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 by using imprisonment as a solution. And of course, we know that uh, Joseph Biden in um, 1994, uh, who uh, claims that um, the Violence Against Women Act was such an important moment in his career, uh, the Violence Against Women Act was couched within the 1994 um, uh, Crime Act, uh, the, the Clinton Crime Act. Uh, and what we're calling for is a process of decriminalization, not a rec recognizing that, um, that threats to safety threats to security come 
um, not primarily from what is defined as crime, but rather from the failure of of, of institutions in our country to address issues of health, issues of, of, of violence, education, et cetera. So abolition is really about rethinking the kind of future we want, the social future, the economic uh, future, the political future. It's about revolution, I would argue. You write in Freedom is a Constant Struggle, neoliberal ideology drives us to focus on individuals, ourselves, individual victims, individual perpetrators. But how is it possible to solve the massive problem of racist state violence by calling upon individual police officers to bear the burden of that history and to assume that by prosecuting them, by exacting our revenge on them, we would have somehow made progress in eradicating racism? So explain what exactly you're demanding. Well, neoliberal logic assumes that the fundamental unit of society is the individual, uh, and I would say the abstract individual. Um, uh, according to that logic, black people can combat racism by pulling themselves up by their own individual bootstraps. Uh, um, that logic recognizes, or fails rather, to recognize that there are institutional barriers that cannot be uh, brought down by individual determination. If a black person is materially unable to attend the university, the solution is not affirmative action, they argue, but rather the person simply needs to work harder, get good grades, and do what is necessary in order to acquire the funds to pay for tuition. Neoliberal logic deters us from thinking about the simpler solution, which is free education. I'm thinking about uh, the fact that we have been aware of the, the, the need for these institutional strategies at least since 1935, and of course before, but I'm choosing 1935 because that was the year when W.E.B. Du Bois published his uh, germinal uh, Black Reconstruction in America. Um, and the question was not what should individual black people do, but rather how to reorganize and restructure post slavery society in order to guarantee the incorporation of those who have who had been formerly enslaved the society could not remain the same or should not have remained the same neoliberalism resists change at the individual level it asks the individual to adapt to conditions of capitalism to conditions of racism <laughs> 